Uh, so our next speaker, you know, we're super, to ha super happy to have uh, Gabriel Farina here to tell about about his work on uh, extensive for ga form games. So uh, yeah, I'll let you uh, I'll let you get started. All right, thanks so much. Um, also, Dylan, I know if you are still offering the moderating the chat kind of oh, yeah, kind yeah. of package, but okay, thanks. I'll, I'll appreciate. It. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Well, hi everybody. Uh, well, thanks so much for being here. Um, you know, like like Dylan said, I'll be talking about uh, extensive form games, but you know, like maybe from a very kind of like online learning point of view. Um, so you know, like no, you know, like knowledge of extensive form games is, is necessary to to understand what I'll be talking about. Um, and you know, I'll be talking specifically about a paper uh, that you know, like it's like joint work with uh, Chung Wei, Peng, and Christian, and they put like a link also in the kind of like the description on the website. All right, I guess. Um, let's see. Yeah, All right, well, I guess, you know, like the, the starting point for, for this talk is this realization that at this point, we know a lot about um, neurograde learning in normal form games, right? So, neurograde learning in the context of normal form games has been studied extensively. If you're not familiar with normal form games, what I mean here is kind of like um, strategic interactions in which Every player acts simultaneously and once. Every player has a set of actions. Uh, they just like pick one action. Their utility depends on the uh, like tuple of actions that were chosen by all the players. And you know it's kind of like one of the the bedrocks of, of game theory. And the reason why uh, you know like there has been so much interest in neurograde learning, or at least one of the reasons, is this landmark result in the theory of learning in games, which says that when all players learn using uh, neurograde dynamics, then the empirical frequency of play converges to the set of course correct equilibria, which basically says that learning, which is a very per player local kind of behavior, can induce kind of like global game theoretic, you know, like notions of equilibria. And, you know, like I, it doesn't really matter actually what neurograde dynamics you use as long as they're like good enough, which means that they uh, guarantee kind of like the, the regret growth of linearity. So in, in the slide I have, for example, multiplicity with, with update, I'll talk about a lot about that specific algorithm, but in, in this result, is actually so powerful that you know it doesn't really depend on one specific algorithm. And in fact, you can also mix and match different algorithms for different agents. You don't really need to know how other agents are learning. Uh, you know, there's even more to, to this. Like you know, here I mentioned when all players learn using neurograde dynamics, and this applies to uh, you know, like the, the the blue box applies to multiplayer general sum games. But you know, like if you have two player zero sum games in particular, then you can get even stronger results. So for example, like the average. Uh, strategies uh, converge to the set of Nash equilibria. And, you know, of course, there's like multiple ways in which you can find this equilibria, which do not include learning. For example, like if, if you have a two players or some game, you could use, um, I don't know, just like um, linear programming, for example. But, um, you know, as of today, this approach using learning is by far the most scalable way of computing game theoretic solutions and equilibrium in large games. And, you know, even from an engineering point of view, there are good reasons for this. Um, like these dynamics have linear time strategy updates, which means that when you know, like the the set of actions for the players is very large, uh, like kind of like updates of the like in this like kind of like learning dynamics are still very efficient. Every agent learns in parallel, so if you have more agents, you can just run you know like their dynamics in parallel. Um, and also, uh, like at least in theory, you know, like in many cases, you can do learning by only looking at the utility of a specific player, and each player does not care about the utility of all the other players, right? So you can learn in a kind of like uncoupled way, what it was called, right? So this is like useful, for example, if you're trying to deploy this like learning dynamics when you don't really know the utilities of all the other agents, right? So it has like all of these good properties. And because of all of these good properties, it's perhaps not surprising that over the past decade, faster and faster neurograde dynamics have been developed for normal form games. And at this point, I mean, this is like debatable, I guess, but uh, I, I, I feel like confident in saying that, you know, like the most studied algorithm probably for, for the task of like normal form games is optimistic multiplicity with updates, kind of like the, the one also with the strongest property. Um, and, you know, like in, in terms of like properties that it guarantees, it's like some incredibly strong properties. Like for example, when all the players learn using optimistic multiplicity with update, then uh, you can show that uh, the, uh, the regret of each individual agent Grows logarithmically over time. This is actually a, kind of like a recent result by Custis. I think I think he talked extensively about about this in this in this kind of like program here at Simmons. Um, at the same time, you know, like not only the dependence on time is logarithmically, but also the dependence on number of actions is logarithmically. It's logarithmic, uh, right? So like already this just like this first like bu big bullet point immediately implies that when you use optimistic multiplicative weights update in um, normal form games, you converge 
to a course to a set of course correct equilibria in cell play at a rate of roughly or tilde one over t. Um, but there's even more, uh, you know, like not only the per player regrets, the regret is, is low, but also the sum of the player regrets you can show is even stronger. So for example, uh, instead of even polygamically in, in time, like the regret actually doesn't grow with, with respect to time, like it's like constant with respect to time. Um, and again, there's like a logarithmic dependence on the number of actions. And furthermore, you know, like this optimistic multiplicative weights update has kind of like last strategy convergence in two players or some. There's like some caveats I feel like we don't really, have not really cracked as a community, like that kind of like problem of last strategy convergence quite yet. There are like some results that require some particular scheduling of step sizes or that require kind of like uniqueness of Nash. But, you know, like by and large, I feel like it's interesting that there's like this one algorithm for normal from games that you know can achieve all of these properties and you know i feel like at this point for normal form games we have really like a good answers as to what it means to learn effectively however normal form games are a rather limited model of strategic interaction as we said you know like they uh, require all players to act once and simultaneously and therefore you know like they have no support for modeling say sequential actions or observations about other players actions Right, so we know a lot about what it means to learn from normal form games, but often normal form games are not really a model of a strategic interaction that's rich enough for us. So a different model of strategic, a strategic interaction that is significantly more expressive is extensive form games. Right, so fundamentally the difference between normal form games and extensive form games is that normal form games, they're like one shot, like every player acts simultaneously at once, whereas in extensive form games, every player instead faces a tree form decision problem. And this tree form decision problem has both decision points and observation points where the agent instead like waits to see to like to observe a signal from the environment. Um, and because of this kind of like a more expressive tree form kind of like structure that can capture both sequential and simultaneous moves, as well as imperfect information. And also they can model explicitly stochastic moves such as like, you know, like you observe a roll of the dice, for example. Um, right, so they are a very expressive model of interaction. And you know, like pretty much all the recreational games you can think about uh, can be easily modeled and have been historically modeled as a consensus from games like chess, uh, poker, uh, bridge. But then, there, of course, there's like also non-recreational interactions, like for example, security games, maybe sequential auctions. There's like you know, like it's it's a, it's a very general uh, formalism, right? So just just to fix some ideas as to you know, like to see how an extensive form kind of like decision problem uh, works. You know, like for example, here I have. Uh, the uh, decision problem that is faced by the first player in Kuhn Poker, which is kind of like a simplified uh, version of Kuhn, and also oh, a, a simplified version of poker. And the way the interaction works is that uh, the interaction starts at the root. Uh, this is like player one. So player one has an observation point. They can observe whether their private card is a jack, a queen, or a king. Right? So this is an observation point. Say that they observe that it's a jack, then the interaction for that player moves to a decision point, and now they have to decide what they want to do and maybe they want to check maybe they want to raise it doesn't really matter like if you don't know what it means in board it's just like two actions um right so say that they decide to check at this point they can observe what the opponent is doing maybe the opponent is in turn checking or maybe the opponent is raising let's just say that the opponent checks well at that point you know like the, the tree has finished so the interaction has ended and there's maybe some payoff that that the player will, will observe for example maybe it's a showdown and you know like they won twenty dollars right so it doesn't really matter uh, you know, like what the actions were, if you don't know what, what poker is, all the only thing that matters is that uh, in an extensive form game, every player faces this kind of tree form decision problem that is made of two types of nodes. You have decision points where the decision maker picks one action out of a set of available actions. And then you have observation points where the decision maker observes a signal drawn from a set of possible signals and decision observation points from a tree. Okay. And again, you know, like uh, we are talking about games, so you know every player is facing some of this. So it's it's not like an MDP or a three MDP where you know like you have some stationary environment. Every player is facing this kind of like decision problem, and you know like the, the observations they receive will change over time when when the game is repeated and in advers in an adversarial way. Right. So there's a fundamental question as to you know before we can do any type of learning over extensive form uh, games, how do we even represent strategies? Like it's not perhaps a priori 100% obvious how you would represent uh, like strategies in a way that is optimization and learning friendly, like for, you know, like for normal form games like rock, paper, scissors, clearly a, like a strategy is like a distribution over the actions they want to play. Uh, when you have a tree, there's like multiple things that you can do and not all of them are equally good. But the good news is that there exists a way of representing strategies in extensive form games so that two things happen. The first thing is that each player strategy set is a low dimensional complex polytope, which is called the sequence form polytope. And the utility functions are multilinear, which means that 
at least like if you just like squint your eyes and just look at the kind of like analytic kind of like structure of solving an extensive form game, it's not very different from a normal form game, right? So in particular, because we have this kind of like convex polytopes of action or like of, of strategies and multilinear utility functions, this enables online learning extensive form games as well as other complex optimization techniques. So for example, you can do online, you know, like gradient descent, you can do mirror descent, you can do a lot of things. Um, Right, so this seems all good, but the reality is that, you know, like online learning results for extensive form games are harder to come by. And this is due to the more intricate strategy set. So we said for a normal form game, we only have a simplex. So we know a lot of things about simplices, um, but for extensive form games, we have these kind of like more complicated polytopes, which have a very uh, kind of like combinatorial structure. And, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to be able to show like properties that you care about that you can attain in normal form games and extensive form games. So for example, you now earlier I was talking about optimistic multiplicative weights and all of the strong properties that it uh, possesses. And you know, in extensive form games, it's not known that you can achieve uh, those properties. Sometimes, you know, like it's not known that you can achieve them like individually, uh, let alone, you know, just like achieving all of them at the same time. Right. So for many years, the extensive form game community, and this is like, you know, like personal opinion. So, you know, just like it is opinable, but I, my, you know, like un understanding of, of, you know, like the extensive form game community is that, you know, for many years, the extensive form game community has been chasing the normal form game community, trying to extend breakthroughs and properties that were known to be achievable in normal form games to extensive form games when it was possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes extensive form games are harder. Um, and, you know, as, as kind of like a proof of this, I have like some examples here of uh, kind of like techniques or tools that were all developed later for extensive form games uh, than normal form games, uh, and sometimes even only with weaker guarantees. So, we, you know, like it took a long time to get good distance measures, like notions of projections, for example, for these more structured polytopes of like tree form uh, strategies. Uh, it took some time to get efficient optimistic algorithms. Um, last iterative convergence, like still way less is known compared to normal form games. And in fact, even more proof, like this paper was actually born from our desire to extend the Pollock T regret bound that was proven by, you know, Custis and, and, and Noah and Max uh, in, in Europe 2021 to extensive form games, right? Like we saw that there was like this breakthrough where now you could guarantee polyarithmic regret when all the players were using the same learning dynamic and, and that was only for normal form games. And there was like this natural question, can we do it in the kind of like more rich class of extensive form games, right? So... I will, I will tell you the answer. Like, yeah, well, the answer is, is yes, we can. But for the first time, at least, we're not really chasing, uh, you know, just like by trying to adopt techniques, but instead we'll, we'll re reduce extensive form to normal form directly, right? And in particular, we, we will answer this question as to does it have to be like this? Does it have to be like extensive form game community always chasing the normal form game community, right? Or can we somehow bridge the gap and inherit like the best properties of normal form games um, for extensive form games? And at least conceptually, there, you might think that there is hope for that, right? Like there's a folklore result that says that every time you have a, an extensive form game, which means, you know, like every player faces like a, a tree form decision problem, well, you can convert it into an equivalent normal form game, where basically what you do is that you enumerate all the deterministic strategies on the tree, and then you build this kind of like big kind of like matrix game or normal form game, um, where kind of like the actions correspond to uh, kind of like full strategies in, in the tree, um, right? So if you con convert your extensive form game into normal form game using that, and then you use, for example, optimistic multiplicative weights update, then you know you you are able to get all of those like strong guarantees, such as for for example like polyarithmic regret. But of course, there's a catch, which is that the number of uh, deterministic strategies or policies in uh, these kind of like tree form decision problems is exponential in the in each player's tree size which means that when you go and use optimistic multiplicative weights on this kind of like uh, expanded game, then you will not have uh, polynomial iterations, right? And it was a com common reason for a long time that because of this exponential blow up, this approach was a computational dead end. And as a consequence, like I said, you know, like specialized techniques were developed for extensive form games and progress on extensive form games and normal form games historically followed separate tracks for decades. Uh, yeah, I mean, the number of rounds often plays logarithmic in the number of uh, deterministic strategies. The number, so, which is rounded in like the height of the chain? In a normal form game. In the normal form, the normal form is logarithmic in the number of uh, actions. Right. 
So like in principle, like are you talking about uh, the computation per round here, or are right. you talking about uh, the number of rounds? Right, right. I'm talking about the computation per round. Right, but you're right. Like those those dynamics, like you said, like for normal games, have a little bit independence of number of options. So this gives even more hope that it could be possible to kind of like you know just like somehow try to simulate fast and still get good regret. And this is actually exactly what the, what the paper is about. So yeah. This issue would also uh, not converse to the subject of the class, which is the most relevant concept for extensive form. I don't know that sub game perfect is the most believable. Like it's known to not be sequential, for example. Right. So sub, sub game perfect, I guess it depends on like on the amount of imperfect information, but like depending on the amount of imperfect information, it might not be a sequential equilibrium. Right. Yeah. Actually, sub games when like in, in the technical sense may not even exist. Right, so it doesn't really fix sequentiality. If, if sequentiality is what you meant by most believable, I think you meant that it's not a like, credible threat. Like, if you're in a first form and you just understand us, you have non credible threat by player, but they would do something suboptimal and they can't use plan. That's something that you Right, right. Okay, I see what you're saying. I, I still think that some game perfect is not really this. Usually, like, people talk about like uh, perfect, like, extensive point perfect, I believe, right? Now. Quasi perfect equilibrium to solve those kind of like issues of not able threats and kind of like being robust in parts of the game tree that you shouldn't reach if not, like, unless somebody made a mistake. Uh, so I'm not sure that some game, but some game perfection definitely helps compared to like just undefined dash. But yeah, like this thing will not guarantee death as well as something. Uh, but also, like I was saying, it's not clear that that's actually the solution to the problem, but that definitely would help. That's a good question. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, Right, so just like just to go back to this kind of common wisdom, you know, like because the exponential blow up, the above approach was thought to be a computational dead end for, for decades, and it turns out that the common wisdom is wrong, right? So this is like what this paper is about. We'll actually show that you can reduce and bridge the, like from extensive form games to normal form games and bridge this gap um, in an efficient way computationally. Okay, but one related question. So I guess one hopeful type of algorithm for normal form games that you might hope to extend. Mm -hmm. Extensive form with it. maybe it's like called the perturbed leader. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, has such an algorithm been studied at all in extensive form games? We, we at some point were talking talking about like uh, called the perturbed leader, leader like IPO, but we haven't really looked into whether or not like any such idea can be extended. But, but that's an excellent question. Um, Right, so the common reason is wrong, and in particular in this paper, what we show is that it is possible to simulate optimistic multiplicative weights on the normal form equivalent of an extensive form game in linear time per iteration in the tree size via kernel trick. And we call this algorithm kernelized optimistic multiplicative weights for obvious reasons. Um, and in fact, this kernelized optimistic multiplicative weights applies not only to extensive form games, but to any polyhedral domain with zero one coordinate vertices, as long as, of course, you can compute the, the kernel efficiently. Um, but we have this main theorem that says that basically optimistic multiplicative weights on the set of vertices of, of a zero one coordinate, uh, like you no know, poly polyhedral set omega, can be simulated using d plus one evaluations of the kernel at each iteration, where d is the dimension in which omega lives. So, like critically, you know, like the number of evaluations does not, does not depend on the number of vertices, but only on the dimension in which the polytope lives, which is kind of like the important result. Um, and what this means it, like immediately is that if each kernel evaluation can be performed in time polynomial into dimension, then optimistic multiplicative weights can be simulated in time polynomial into dimension. And when you just look at the specific case of extensive form games, you know, like we said, kernelized optimistic multiplicative weights closes part of this gap between learning in, in these two domains. And you know, just like it achieves all the strong properties of optimistic multiplicative weights update uh, that were so far only known to be achievable in normal form games, including the polylog regret that uh, Custis and, and his group worked on, as well as any future regret bounds that might get proven for optimistic multiplicative weights update. Because at this point, it's not like we're taking an algorithm, modifying it, and then you know just like showing a bound. We're just using the same algorithm that people have been studying and refining analysis for. So if somebody tomorrow comes up and says, hey, wait, actually it's not log to the 4t, but it's log to, to the second t, uh, or like, or just like log t, or even just like constant, then you know we would inherit all of that for extensive form games directly. So I, I think there's like this kind of like added value that we are not introducing a new algorithm; we're just simulating one efficiently. And on top of all of this, there's also something else that surprised us, which surprised that surprised us, which is that as an as unexpected byproduct, kernelized optimistic multiplicative weights obtains new state of the art regret bound among all of the online learning algorithms for extensive form problems. 
right? So there had been a lot of research as to how do you build uh, kind of like efficient, you know, linear time regression, for example, uh, online learning methods for extensive from games and, you know, regret bounds were known. And then it turns out that just by simulating optimistic multiplicative weights, you just like do better than like decades of research on like specialized methods for extensive from games. So not only the common wisdom was wrong, right? But, but when you kind of like violate it, you know, like you get extra properties and those improve on the regret bound compared to anything else. I say in particular, this is like not important, but just like to point out some of the improvements that, that uh, kernelized multiplicative weights and optimistic multiplicative weights have. You know, like if you look at the dependence on the, the like L1 diameter of the strategy space, we have kind of like a square root dependence on the exponent, right? So like if earlier it was exponent one, like for example, in the first class of algorithms, then now we have a square root. And if the earlier exponent was two, now we have a, just like a one at the, at the exponent. Right, and like I said, you know, like we also have near optimal uh, polygorithmic regret bounds inherited from uh, kind of like Custis and, and Max and Noah's analysis. Yeah, so the yeah the line separates um, the non-optimistic methods from the optimistic methods, right? And it's kind of interesting that um, I, I mean I'm not aware of like matching lower bounds or anything, but like uh, usually the kind of like dependence on the size is squared if you want optimism. Right, so this is actually like, I guess, as far as I know, like in like an open question still as to if, if that's tight or not, but um, it's kind of like interesting that, you know, we have the separation and, and the, you know, like if you want optimism, then you have to pay a bigger cost. Um, all right, okay, so I guess that concludes kind of like the introduction. So now you know what's in the paper. Um, and now I guess we can dig deeper a little bit into uh, some of the, the technical bits uh, that make this result possible. So I'll start with some preliminaries. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about online learning and normal form games. I just assume that most of us are familiar, so I'll, I'll go a little bit fast. But you know, online learning fundamental. Ah, sorry, yeah. Sorry, just before we go into the, mm -hmm. I guess, um, I probably missed it, or misunderstood. What exactly are we learning here? Or, what is the appropriate? Concept that this is to, or that's that, no, that's, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, this will be for course correct okay. um, There's also like uh, implications for Nash if for the players or but I mean, the, the, the thing is, but I guess that's not surprising. Um, but yeah, no, that, that's an excellent question. There's an open question as to how, can we learn fast for other types of equilibrium, for example. Yeah, so that, that's definitely an open question as far as I know. Um, for normal form games, I guess we've done some work also with, with this piece about um, swap regret, for example. Um, but that's for normal form games, and it's not clear if you can kernelize that algorithm, for example, for extensive form games, right? So there's a lot of open questions here. Um, right, so we were talking about online learning, uh, right? The idea of online learning is simple. You know, you, at least like in its most kind of like basic form, you have a set of, a finite set of actions, A, um, and you consider the following abstract model of a decision maker. At every time t, the decision maker has to select a distribution over the actions, right? So it's like some lambda t of like convex combination coefficients effectively over the set of actions. So it's like a vector, a non-negative vector indexed over actions such that, uh, you know, like the sum of the mass that you put on the actions is equal to one. Uh, then what happens is that the environment picks a reward vector, um, which, uh, sorry, I guess I, I that this is a typo, it's like r to the a, right? Like it's a, it's a reward vector in the dimension of number of actions. It, it doesn't have to be non-negative. Um, and shows that reward vector to the decision maker. And finally, you know, like the utility of the decision maker is then the inner product between the uh, distribution that they selected over the actions and the reward vector, and then the iteration continues, right? Like, and over time, what you want is you want the regret, which is defined as kind of like the, you know, like the difference between uh, how much you could have done if you, if you had always picked the best distribution in hindsight minus how much you've actually done in terms of like sum of the actual uh, utility for the decision maker. You want the, this regret to grow sublinearly, uh, right? And in particular, the reason why you care about uh, sublinear regret is that uh, it's known that decision-making algorithms that guarantee sublinear regret in time, in the worst case, converge to equilibrium in games. Um, and you know, like out of kind of like all the algorithms that we know for this kind of like online learning problem, the way I defined it, uh, multiplicative weights update is probably the most well-studied algorithm that has this property of guaranteeing sublinear regret in the worst case. And I want to go through, like go over like how it works. It's very simple. Uh, it, in the first iteration, the distribution lambda is completely uniform, right? So it's just like one over number of actions uh, times the indicator, that times the vector one. And then what we do is that at every iteration, we output uh, the kind of like the incumbent distribution, 
we observe a reward vector. And then what we do is that we update the distribution by multiplying basically every like probability that we had at the previous step by kind of like a, a bonus factor that is exponential in the reward that that action got. Okay, so we just have this kind of like, uh, you know, every action will be now selected with the previous probability times exponential of some step size parameter times the reward that that action got at, at, the, at the last round. Right, and then of course we have to renormalize because we have to output a, um, like a distribution. And, you know, like this is like kind of like multiplicative weights update. The optimistic version I've been talking about a lot uh, is obtained simply by replacing this RT with, you know, just like a, a different kind of like formula. Um, right. And it's known that when you use optimistic, then you can unlock, even in the worst case, like faster uh, regret bounds than what you can without the optimism. Um, right. Like for this talk, because it's so easy to go from one to the other, I will always kind of like ignore optimism and, uh, you know, like all the techniques will apply to uh, optimism directly. Right, so let me briefly talk about normal form games at this point, right? They're, like we said, simultaneous, uh, non sequential games. Uh, every player has a final set of actions, AI, right? So a player has a final set of action, AI. Um, and, you know, like the receive, and every player receives a payoff that depends on the combination of the actions that were selected. Um, the strategy for each player is simple probability distribution over their action. And this idea of learning games, finally, we can define it. It's just this idea that each player now plays according uh, to. Uh, like a learning algorithm, like in the way that we just defined it. And after each repetition, the reward vector of each agent is just the gradient of the expected utility for that agent, given the strategy of all the other players. Right? So now you can, if you have a normal form game, you can, uh, you know, just like basically let all the players play against each other by giving each other like gradient of the utility. And this is what people mean when they say that they're learning in the game. So this is for normal form games, but, you know, like as, as I mentioned, this talk is a lot about extensive form games, but you know we'll abstract extensive form games. We'll remove all of the uh, kind of like the nasty notation. I think extensive form games, the, the thing that they need the most is like a notational breakthrough. So instead, we will uh, move to an even bigger class that you know it's like uh, you know it's like a superset of, of extensive form games, which is called polyhedral convex games. And very abstractly, the idea of a polyhedral convex game is that in a polyhedral convex game, the set of strategies of each player is given as a convex polytope omega i, right? So like we said in normal form game, the set of strategies is the probability distributions over the set of actions. Now, instead we have a general convex polytope, not just a simplex, right? So we represent it as kind of like a tuple where we have number of players, the set of actions, and then we always we'll, we'll, we will always assume that the utility functions are multilinear. This is always guaranteed for uh, normal form games just like by kind of like definition of, of what it means like for like of expected utility but here it, it just takes a little bit uh like more care so like we'll assume that the utility functions are multilinear and you know like the, the interesting thing about polyhedral convex games is that if you take all the things that we talked about for normal form games and you now replace the probability like the set of probability distributions of actions with just like the set omega i a lot of things go through right in particular the concept of learning agent or regret you know like in regret we had max over all probability distributions over the over the actions now you have max over all points in uh omega i for example for player i like every everything just goes through um which means that uh you know like we can, we can do learning and the reason why we care about polyhedral convex games is that extensive form games are polyhedral convex games So basically for like for now for the rest of the talk, we'll not, and until the end, we'll not talk about extensive form games, but rather we'll talk about polyhedral convex games as our like kind of like a setting. And we will see that this kernelized optimistic multiplicative weights applies to all polyhedral convex games whose kind of like set of um, strategies omega has integral vertices, right? Like in particular vertices that have zero one coordinates. Yeah, so. You know, like in particular, like with extensive form games, we said, oh, we can always kind of like enumerate the strategies over the tree and then build a bigger normal form game out of that. Well, it turns out that this idea is not unique to extensive form games. In all polyhedral convex games, you can always, uh, you know, convert them into an equivalent normal form game uh, in which each player's action set in this equivalent normal form game is just a set of vertices. Right, so when people talk about the normal form equivalent of an extensive form game, tacitly, they're basically what they're doing is that they're just doing this more general a procedure where every time you have a polyhedral, polyhedral convex game, you can enumerate the vertices and then build an equivalent normal form game, like where each agent now has to pick out of the set of vertices. And you can think about this as sort of a change of variable, like the like learning on, in a polyhedral convex game would have amounted to kind of like learning how to pick points in the polytope and instead 
of picking points in the polytope, now you're learning to find convex combination coefficients over the vertices. And you know, because the sets are convex, you know, it's it's known that you can reach every point with an appropriate convex combination, right? So you're just like basically transforming the problem over instead of picking points in the, in like in, in the in your set directly, you just first pick convex combination coefficients over vertices, and then you just like do learning over that. Yeah. In the extensive form, the vertices are deterministic tree form structures. They're like normal form, well, reduced normal form plans. Okay, so if you view a reduced normal form plan, it's kind of like a, a, a bit string of zeros and one, depending on like the, what sequences are active. Uh, then the set of all reduced normal form plans is the set of vertices of the sequence form polytope. Okay, so. Like, Distribution over the then you would try to find a distribution over vertices, right? Like in your. So, where are those exponential? Oh, yeah, yeah. But the number of vertices can very well be exponential. Like at this point, I'm not talking about efficiency, but I'm just saying that every polyhedral convex game can be converted into an equivalent normal form game by just looking at the set of vertices, right? Like if you do that, of course, it will still pay exponential prices just because, you know, like if you did that in particular in extensive form games, you would incur into all the problems that we talked about. But what's what's interesting is that you know, like the the process at this point of learning in in the normal form equivalent um, of a general polyhedral convex game using multiplicity weights of date, you can think of it as multiplicity weights of date that tracks you net over the vertices. This is like the, the one other than we will care about. So in particular, we will say we can simulate running uh, multiplicity weights of date on the say like the normal form equivalent of an accessible game. What we mean is that we are able to simulate this vertex and w u r one. And you know, like I, I'll, I'll go over what it does. Basically, vertex MWU is just like MWU over the set of vertices. So it keeps track of so like an incumbent distribution over the vertices. At the beginning, it's the uniform distribution, uh, right? Like VI, as you said, like the setup is the, the vertices of your uh, convex uh, set of strategies for the guy. Um, and then what happens is that at every iteration, the, we need to play a point in omega, and we'll play the point that corresponds to the convex combination of the right? So we'll play the point xt, which is sum over the vertices of probability of that vertex times that vertex. And so we just play the convex combination given by lambda, and then we'll observe, uh, we will observe a reward vector, and then we will set uh, the new distribution using uh, the same formula that we had for multiplicity weights, with the only difference that um, you know, like now you don't really have. Uh, kind of like the kind of like the component of of the reward vector that corresponds to the specific action. You have an inner product, right? Like basically, the only difference with kind of like the, the regular multiplicity weights is that there's just like this inner product here, and of course the fact that we output uh, convex combinations. Okay, so basically, like for the rest of the talk, we'll, I'll just like try to convince you that we can simulate this without actually doing exactly what the steps are are saying. Like in particular, we don't really have to update our distribution vertex by vertex. Right, but before we do that, uh, as usual, you know, vertex optimistic multiplicity weights is analogous. Uh, you know, just like like we said, you know, instead of the the reward, you use two times the reward minus the previous re reward. Uh, everything just goes through. Um, and the other thing that you know we should check is that vertex OMW. It's it's immediate to see from the analysis that you know, just like uh, the the paper by Christine No and, and Max have guarantees polylogarithmic uh, regret in with respect to time when used by all players to learn in a polyhedral convex game. So the main question of the paper, again, is can vertex multiplicity weights update or optimistic multiplicity weights update be simulated efficiently? Yes. Can you assume perfect equal? Yes. Yeah, for a games, I will always assume perfect equal. Um, yeah, good question. Okay, so the main theorem, so I just like move vertex and move vertex, they're not, nothing has changed. But the main theorem is that when the set omega has zero one coordinate vertices, then vertex and w can be implemented using d plus one evaluation of a zero one polyhedral kernel at each iteration, which I will talk about in a second what it is. But you know, again, like crucially, the important thing here is that the number of evaluations depends only on the dimension and not the number of vertices. You can have poly polyhedral sets with exponentially many vertices. Um, but as long as the dimension is low, you can simulate this algorithm fast. This is what the, the main theorem says. Okay, so with that, let me tell you a little bit about what this uh, zero one polyhedral kernel is. Again, like our setup will be that we have a set omega, which is our, our polytope, 
uh, V is a set of vertices, and we're assuming that the vertices are have like zero one coordinates. So to define the kernel, we'll first need to define the zero one feature map of Omega, right? So the feature map, what it does is that it maps a point in R D into a point in R V, where V is the set of vertices. We say, right? So like it kind of like blows up a vector, and in particular, if you give any vector x in R D to this map, it will produce a vector. Uh, in RV, where every every coordinate that corresponds to any vertex V is just defined as this kind of like product, right? So basically what it does is that given any vector, for each vertex, it computes the product of the coordinates that are hot for that vertex. Remember that vertices are integrals, zero, one, right? So there's like, it's well-defined what it means uh, for a, co a coordinate to be hot. It just means that in the vertex, it has a one, right? So it just computes the product there. And once you have this, the zero one polyhedral kernel is, you know, just like defined in the usual way, right? Like as the inner product between the kind of like the feature maps of two points. Okay, so if you just plug in the definition, you get the second equality. All right, so very simple, very clean definition of, of the kernel in terms of, of, of like what the formula looks like. And I'll try to explain now how the feature map and the kernel help simulate vertex MW. So what it did is I rewrote, like, you know, just copy pasted vertex and W, nothing has changed. It was still like the same algorithm. Um, and, you know, I, I also put the definition of a feature map on the left again, like nothing has changed. Um, there are two ideas that make, you know, like this kind of like simulation using the kernel trick, uh, like possible. The first idea is this lemma that says that actually these uh, points, like this kind of like uh, distribution is lambda, have a lot of structure. And in particular, at every time t, they're proportional to the feature map of a specific vector that we give, right? So this means that these distributions lambda for the way they're updated, they cannot be too free, right? They have a lot of structure. Uh, the proof is by induction, the proof is easy. Um, and if you, don't, you know, if you don't really want to care about like details and you only want to stay kind of like at a high level, what this means is that we actually don't really need to keep track of lambda, right? Like in a way, all the complexity of lambda, all the variability that it has is fully subsumed by this vector B that we have here, right? Like if we knew B, we could always compute lambda whenever we want, just like by, by evaluating the feature map if we wanted to, right? Kind of like all the data inside of lambda is kind of like stored inside of B. And note that B is a vector in, R, in RD, right? B is a, is a low dimensional vector, of course, right? So it, like being kind of like the image of the feature map means that kind of like the, the space in which you start is, is low dimensional, right? So again, so this means that we actually, do not really need to perform line five explicitly. We can just, you know, just like do the, you know, compute these BTs, which are like simple to compute given the history and line five, you can forget about it. But of course, you know, if you forget about line five and we don't really store explicitly the lambdas, you know, how can we evaluate line three with only implicit access to lambda via B, right? Like now we're storing B instead of lambda, but how do we do line three where, you know, we have to do the sum that depends on lambda. And this is where the second idea comes in. The idea is that at all times t, you can prove that lambda is proportional to the feature map. Sorry, uh, you, you can prove that xt can be reconstructed from b using this formula, right? And and the you know like the the important thing like forget about like exactly what, what the vectors are inside of this uh, this formula, but you know like it it uses d plus one kernel evaluations. You have one per each numerator, right? Like you have this kernel evaluation for the first dimension and you know, like one per each dimension until the last one. And then the denominator is always the same, right? The denominator is always a kernel evaluation between BT and one and the vector one, right? So we only need D plus one kernel evaluations. And the idea for the proof is, is not too complicated. It extends a very beautiful insight of Takimoto and Wormer. Um, so, you know, like when you put together these two pieces, you know, like you don't really need to store lambda anymore. You can just store the Bs. And you don't really need, like in line three, which was kind of like the complicated convex combination, we have a close formula now that only depends on the kernel. So you can just like simulate exactly vertex MW by using this algorithm on the right, which is kernel MW, kernelized MW. Okay, so this is kind of like, you know, like the, I guess like the main kind of like result of the paper. So yeah. why does, uh... <clears throat> You need this kernel evaluation to be part of the part of the world. Right, right. The basis is only saying that it takes D plus one evaluations. But depending on your polytope, it might not be easy to compute the kernel. So that's why we're going to talk now about actually what can we do, what can we do in the sense from games. And um, 
in extensive form games, the idea is not too complicated. Um, any particular, like the kernel of omega for extensive form games can be evaluated in time linear in the number of edges of the true form decision problem, which also means that kernelized optimistic multiplicity weights can be implemented with quadratic time per iteration. It's quadratic time because we need d plus one evaluations of the kernel at every iteration. And now the theorem that I gave you at the top says that each evaluation uh, depends kind of like cost linear in D, right? So like we have D squared kind of dependence where D is the dimension of the polytope, which happens to be the number of edges in the, in the decision problem, like in the, in the tree form decision problem, right? So, but at least with this theorem that we have at the top, you, you already get a, a polynomial implementation. And then I'll show you that we can do better. Uh, just like, let me show you a little bit of the, of the idea as to how it works. Basically the idea is that the sequence form strategy spaces have a strong bottom-up combinatorial structure. Uh, that you can kind of like characterize using partition products and convex solves. And effectively, what we do is that we exploit the combinatorial structure by introducing some form of like partial kernels for subtrees. And then at every decision point in the tree form decision problem, uh, but what we have is that the kernel for the subtree rooted at that decision uh, point is kind of like a weighted sum of kernels for each of the child subtrees. And then for every subtree that instead is rooted at the observation point, we have a product of kernels. Right? So we have this kind of like nice bottom up computation for extensive form games, right? This is kind of like the intuition as to how it works. The details are always kind of like, you know, just like complicated with like a lot of notation about trees, but this is fundamentally the idea. We have product and sums. Uh, sorry, but there's another player. I mean, uh, there's incompleteness of information. Of the player. Right, but, but then, so when you, when you look at an extensive form games, you, if you look at just one player at a time, uh, you can define it's kind of like strategy space only for itself. Right, and the the imperfect information just like comes naturally from what the observation points are. Like if they cannot observe something, like the observation point will just have less signals. That doesn't affect the dynamic program. Right, right. That doesn't affect anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, so you can just assume that these kind of like three form decision problems have already been pre-computed for all the players, uh, and then every player just has like their own set and they want to do online learning on that one. But yeah, but that, that, that's a good question. That's always one of the tricky things with extensive form games, is like going from the, the game tree where all the players are kind of like in the same game tree versus kind of like the online learning kind of like one player at a time point of view and, and seeing what the strategy space is. But, but you know, like just like from, I guess like at least this is like some intuition, this gives a linear time bottom up computation of the kernel. Um, and like I said, you know, like this gives immediately quadratic time for iteration and decision tree size, but can we do better than quadratic iterations? And if you remember, at all times t, the iterate that we need to output can be reconstructed from the b vector using this kind of complicated formula. But you know, like the kernel evaluations that you need, they have a lot of kind of like structure, right? They all take bt as the first vector, and there's always like a one minus kind of like an indicator vector, and then in, in the denominator there's always bt and one. So the question is, can we amortize the cost of computing those d plus one kernels, for example, and instead of paying? quadratic time, we can just reuse information and maybe do it in linear time. And the answer is yes. So we can implement kernelized OMW with linear time per iteration in the decision tree size by amortizing the complexity of the D plus one kernel evaluations by re reusing intermediate computations, which, you know, like in summary, what it, it says is that in extensive form games, uh, kernelized OMW guarantees all these things. It has linear time iterations, polygorithmic regret when used by all players in the extensive form games. And this is like the first time that it's, it's shown that this is possible. Uh, with you know just like efficient iterations, uh, it has more favorable regret bounds than all prior known extensive form game algorithms, which you know surprised us at the time. And you know like this is also future proof. Like we said, if somebody tomorrow comes up with a better analysis of optimistic multiplicity weights update for uh, normal form games, then we inherit all of the like all of the improvements directly. So with that, you know, like, let me just like quickly wrap up, you know, we introduced this kernelized OMW, it simulates running OMW on the vertices of a zero one polyhedral set. And it does it in a like black box fashion, fashion by uh, having access to this uh, kernel uh, oracle or like kernel function. Now the kernel function can be evaluated in linear time in the sense of the tree form decision problem in extensive form games. This is true for all players. Uh, it, you know, in extensive form games, it defies this kind of like long held common wisdom about uh, the fact that you shouldn't actually computationally, you know, like be thinking about converting extensive form games into normal form games, but like it, it completely shows that that actually is not really accurate. And in fact, not only there are benefits in terms of, you know, like this polygrammic convergence uh, or like polygrammic regret and like therefore accelerated convergence to course 
correct equilibrium, but also it leads to new state of the art regret bounds. And if you want, it's also kind of like, a, I, think, I think at least to me, you know, like it's, it's a very fundamental geometric fact about these extensible games. Like I feel like this should have been known, right? Like the fact that the vertices have such a structure that you can like simulate running optimistic multiplicative weights in extensible games directly without having to come up with a different method. Right. There's also other sets for which the kernel can be validated efficiently. In the paper, we have, like, especially in the appendix, like, uh, like a, a few sections. Uh, the unit hypercube is kind of simple, uh, right? Like, if you have a unit hypercube, then the vertices are basically the, like set zero one to the to the dimension. And you know, like, if you just take the definition of the kernel, it's it's easy to see combinatorially that you can evaluate it in linear time by just using this formula. Uh, if you have a set of flows in a DAG, you can do dynamic programming on the topological sorting of the, of the nodes to compute the kernel efficiently. If you have double, double stochastic matrices, you can do some form of approximate computations. That that's kind of actually you can prove that exact is hard. Um, if you have n sets, uh, you can compute the kernel using dynamic programming in, in linear time. Uh, spanning tree is another combinatorial set for which we have efficient kernel computation. And the other nice thing is that in many cases, actually, kernelized OMW unifies existing approaches for some of these kind of like domains, um, you know, under this kind of like unified framework of like kernelized OMW. You know, we're especially, I think, in debt to the work by Takemoto and Wormuth on path kernels for graphs uh, for some of the precursor work. Um, you know, like I, I feel like it's fair to say that the kernel that we use in kernelized OMW can be seen as a significant generalization of uh, their path kernels for DAGs. Uh, for extensible from games, things are more complicated than paths on DAGs because we have observation points which can like increase the flow uh, of probability if, if that makes sense to like if, if you're if you're familiar with extensible from games. If not, it doesn't matter. But like you know, like, there are like some complications. But you know, I think without Takemoto and Wormuth, it, it's unclear if we would have been able to uh, complete some of the the pieces that were missing. Um, and yeah, and let me also mention a couple of open questions. Uh, Right, like all of the work so far uh, needed to assume zero one coordinate vertices at different key points in the proof. Can we somehow develop a more advanced kernel function that can work for, um, you know, just like general polytopes uh, or even maybe like not even polytopes. I mean, who knows, right? Like maybe you can kernelize way more than polytopes. Um, and then the second question is, well, you know, like kernelized optimistic multiplicative weights shows this polygarithmic regret for extensive form games, which is a setting we care a lot about. But you know there might be more general complex games that we care about where this technology you know like it is not viable just maybe because the kernel is too expensive or or maybe it's not even a polytope so uh, you know there's even more hurdles so I guess there's like this other kind of like general second question can your optimal regret bounds be guaranteed for general uh, convex games right like beyond extensive form games so that that's all I had I'm happy to you know take questions I, I know if there were like any on the on, like on the chat on on Zoom okay perfect. Yeah, otherwise, uh, yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks a lot. That's a really nice work. Uh, are there any uh, questions right now? I can do just like a basic. Oh, okay. Noah has a question. Well, actually, I'll, I'll just do a quick question first, which is just like, uh, so I guess for the first question up here. Mm -hmm. So I guess classically, right, kind of like as Kostas was mentioning earlier, you know, there's this approach to handling combinatorial action sets, which is doing kind of like follow the perturbed leader, mm -hmm. right? And what does that require? That requires that I can kind of do like linear optimization over my, uh, you know, over my decision set, right? Mm -hmm. So like when we talk about going beyond zero one coordinate vertices, is there any hope of getting something that works kind of like at that level of generality? Or do you think that's like too much to ask for? That's a good question. I think there is a little bit more that can be done. Um, I think we toyed at some point with like some form of like weighted kernel where basically there was like an exponent, for example, that depended on the the entry in the vertex. I basically like it, it, you you like you map vectors low dimensional into vectors high dimensional, uh, where you can do vertex specific things. And if the vertex, for example, had I don't know, like a zero one or a two, then when you had a two, you had like a square, for example. Um, so I think a little bit more can be done, but it's not really clear that we have a uh, general. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I'll go uh, take it over to Noah. Let me stop. Um, do you have any ideas about how to extend this to like EFCCE or EFCE? That's uh, something that I've been thinking about. I don't really think we are quite there yet, but a lot of this machinery extends in that direction. 
Oh, let's see. Okay, let me run over here. Um, this is maybe a little bit far out there, but your initial sort of observation that you can transform an extensive form game to a normal form game, something similar, I guess, holds for a Markov game where you could sort of take a step back and, and view your strategy space as the space of all possible policies in the Markov game. Do you see there being a similar trick in that setting as you're doing here? I don't know. Like that, that's a good question. That's something that we, we wondered as well. Um, but I, I, I don't know that anybody has looked into that yet. So, but that, that's that's a good question. Okay. The Markov game requires non-zero one. I was wondering about this as well. Um, yeah, there's another question from uh, Amy in the chat, which is another thing that I was also wondering about. Which is like, uh, yeah, can you say a little bit about? Uh, to what extent this approach extends to kind of like other variants of mirror descent beyond multiplicative weights? I see that, for example, like with uh, like Euclidean regularization. Yeah, I mean, like, kind of or, or even just like, you know, some regularizer, right? I see. I feel like this really fundamentally relies on the multiplicative kind of like structure that is given by the, like the entropic regularizer. So for example, like if, if you did OMD with quadratic regularization, which is fundamentally like projected gradient descent, um, I don't think you can do this, but, but I know cool. I might be wrong, uh, you know. Sounds good. Let's see, are there any other questions? All right, maybe we should stop it there. Let's uh, thank Gabriel again. Thanks. So we'll take a quick break and then we'll be back at uh, 1130 for the last session of the morning.